you all for braving uh, wet roads, icy roads, and terrible traffic to get here this morning. We're, we're grateful and um, apologize for the frustration, I'm sure, that accompanied all of it. We're very excited to have you all here today um, discuss you know, research-based pedagogies, workshops, some nice presentations. Um, to get us started today, we're going to have Noah Finkelstein say a few words. He's faculty in physics and also a man of many other hats. So <laughs> thank you all. Thank you so much, uh, Ann Barry. So uh, again, my name is Noah Finkelstein. I'm a professor in the physics department. I have a head for hats, as you may see. Um, Cliff, you and I are the same barber. Um, I'm thrilled to be here and thrilled that we have the opportunity. So um, in addition to being a professor in the physics department, I'm also one of the directors for the Center for STEM Learning, which is one of the uh, hosts here, want to acknowledge um, Ann Barry is a program manager for the center. Um, uh, Gabriella Katz and Stephanie Chastine, who both really assembled and did the heavy lifting behind this uh, event. Thank you both so much, really. It's tremendous. I um, want to acknowledge William Tarantino, who's probably greeting you uh, folks out at the uh, door here, has been doing a lot of the organizational um, and background uh, infrastructure for this. Um, and we are thrilled to be partners with you and hosting you. I also want to give a thanks to uh, uh, Michael Q. He's not here yet. Oh, yes, he is, in the back, uh, who is partly responsible for this event. Thank you, Michael, for reaching out. And uh, as our director for the Faculty Teaching Excellence Program, uh, Marianne Shea acknowledged you invited us. So thank you so much for saying, wait a sec, this is time for us to start building community for us to start collaborating across the state. And we are in a tremendous position for doing so. So thanks to you all for showing up. Um, and thank you. Right. Uh, so I am a huge fan of community and of networks and for the potential that can come around um, from these fundamental forms of infrastructure uh, uh, that networks and community provide us. If we think about what education is, education is not the acquisition of facts. It is not the uh, task-oriented performance of individual students alone. Those things may be important. But it is socialization. It is the enculturation of students. It is bringing them into our communities as mathematicians, biologists, as citizens of the state of Colorado, as members of the community, so that we can engage and invest in the future. And never has it been more important uh, that we do so. I don't know if you all are familiar with this. I'm, uh, one of my other hats is I'm on the Board of Trustees for the Higher Learning uh, Commission, which in fact accredits all of our institutions in this region. It accredits, I think, 1,018 institutions across um, uh, the North Central Administration region here. And so I've been learning a bit more about the uh, community college system, which I've been, unfortunately, not, I haven't known enough about. I'm not having, uh, I've taught actually for a year in uh, San Diego Community College. Um, and learn a bit, and I'm a huge fan of the opportunity this provides. I've now been doing some research on the uh, broader landscape. So this comes um, from the American Association of Community Colleges here, and this is a, um, a call to arms, a call to address uh, the challenges that are in front of us. For us to recognize the essential work that we are engaged in, in investing not only in the future of our students and citizens, but the very future of our society, for our region, our state, and nation. And never has it been more clear that this is what's happening today. The landscape of what is happening in higher education today is shifting. And there were more opportunities than we've had in the past and more challenges. And so um, I don't need to remind you about the challenges of budget, right? That we're projected to be the first state um, in the union to go to zero funding for all of higher education, for public higher education. Thankfully, we're not in Wisconsin um, that is proactively cutting hundreds of millions of dollars from higher education, or Louisiana, or Illinois, or Tennessee. But maybe that's the landscape that we're uh, engaged in right now. Right now, we already have tremendous challenge with college completion uh, here, where we rank nationally, uh, internationally as, I believe, 16th in college attainment of 24 to uh, 25 to 34 year olds uh, here for being a uh, having such tremendous infrastructure. I'm not a, a jingoist in the, say, in the sense that we have to be the best in the world, 
But with the resources that we have and the infrastructure that we've developed because of higher education, because of the work that we've done historically post-World War II, we, we are obliged to pay it forward to build uh, uh, the infrastructure uh, that we can. And we will be able to do so through these forms of networks and partnerships that we are positioned to start building on today to really see how we can create collaborative enterprise, faculty member to faculty member, department to department, institution to institution. And I'll come back to this theme uh, very briefly in a minute um, here. The good news is now we know more than ever about the nature of education and higher education. And so the nice thing that's happening is while there are tremendous pressures for us to be um, to focus on rote skills and, and practices in higher education and their uh, uh, tendencies to more testing and accountability, which may in fact direct us in the wrong direction because those people who are making decisions about higher education right now are not those, not those of us who are in higher education know what it means for a student to learn and to engage and to succeed in the classroom. But those messages are starting to get out there now and they're aligned in ways that haven't been precedented before. So we have the right goals. This comes from the American Association of Colleges and Universities, their LEAP initiative funded from uh, Lumina Foundation here, that these are the kinds of goals that we do want. So students to have understanding about human culture and content knowledge. What, what are the foundations of biology, physics, chemistry, mathematics, and the rest of it? What are the intellectual practices and creative thinking skills, as well as social responsibility and integrative learning? These are consensus among all institutions of higher education. Thousands of respondents across hundreds of uh, institutions of higher education come to a like, remarkable degree of consensus about what are the objectives and why we have this form of a broad liberal education for our students, what it is that we can do. And what's amazing is that's matched by industry. While a lot of we talk about the, the field in STEM, it's being driven by calls for industry. Industry has the same sets of objectives, which is really remarkable. Gives us cover and cause to engage in these same kinds of practices. We also know what works, and that's what we're going to spend a lot of time engaged in today, is spending time on what works, what is known from uh, discipline-based education research, from folks uh, uh, in biology, chemistry, math, um, engineering, physics, uh, to think about the nature of student learning in those disciplines, as well as people from psychology, education, sociology, anthropology, who are saying, what are the nature of these sort of social enterprises that we engage in? How can we construct environments? And what, what's impressive is, we know that there are high-impact practices, and impressively, the more kinds of high-impact practices that you engage in, and whether it's FET or the Learning Assistant Program or otherwise, the better off students will do. And what I mean by better off is more likely they will graduate. And especially those students who come from non-dominant or increasingly dominant communities here, um, uh, the Latino community in, in California, differentially benefits from these uh, practices that benefit everybody engaged. But that said, we have plenty of challenges um, that sit before us here. Um, we are not providing access, and we are not providing access differentially um, by demographic here. And so uh, these are six bins of high impact practices um, where you engage students in integrative experiences uh, here, capstone experiences, field experience, undergraduate research. So that's one of the national leading scholars on undergraduate research is Ann Barry sitting in the back of the room. Uh, who introduced me. We know about these to be really important, and yet we're not providing opportunities for our students in these kinds of practices, despite our knowing that these are the things that matter on um, engage. So how is it that we can go about that? And the answer is we can change the system. We are the ones to go about doing this. I just heard a talk from uh, a keynote speaker at the recent uh, Higher Learning Commission conference, Wes Moore, um, who's interestingly enough quoting the other Wes Moore in saying, Impressively, a lot of, he, he was asking this fellow, also named Wes Moore, are we the products of our environments? And the other Wes Moore, in fact, said, no, we're not the products of our environments. We're the products of our expectations. It was a really profound statement, is that everybody has the opportunity, um, we can create the opportunity for everybody to succeed and engage. And paraphrasing Claude Steele, a, a psychologist who sort of broke open the field of stereotype threat and engagement, so, uh, has demonstrated, and we know this from across a uh, wide range, that setting a high bar of expectations and the resources and the structures to achieve those expectations is what we want for our students. And what I would say is, this is not only true for us creating environments for our students, but for us ourselves. We are only limited by our expectations of ourselves in creating a network and transforming 
higher education in the state of Colorado and serving as a national model for how we might engage um, and move forward. So let's set high bars and demand and establish the resources that are necessary for us to achieve those high bars. And we can start doing so today. And whether it was in discussions I had before about going out and writing for collaborative grants for ATE, right, from the National Science Foundation, or otherwise, or Lula, or, and there's loads of opportunity for us provided that we all can engage. And I'm thrilled that we have representatives from all of these communities and more here present today. And I think that's extremely important. So thank you for your work, and thank you for the work that you have done and that which you will do. And I'm a huge fan of networks. May we create this web of integration among our institutions. I'm very grateful to be um, uh, the inaugural Timmerhouse Ambassador uh, Awardee uh, for the University of Colorado system. That's a new position where I'm funded to travel around and work and create networks and talk about the value of education and import for the state. And I am putting my money and Klaus Timmerhaus's bequest behind this to engage. So my name is Noah Finkelstein. I would love to continue these discussions. Um, I will be only around briefly today as I'm traveling already for um, this, uh, this morning. But please do take me up on the offer to come join you, to come work with you locally and build a sense of community. So thank you so much for being here. It's a tremendous pleasure. I'm thrilled. This is already a tremendous success. And I will turn it over to one of the architects of today's event. Dr. Stephanie Chastine, who's the Associate Director for our Science Education Initiative um, and a scholar of that which works in transforming higher education and faculty development and high impact practices, Stephanie. Thank you. This change is always a process, right? We haven't got it all figured out yet. <laughs> May we never. <laughs> so, um, so I just wanted to say a few things about some themes um, th for today's conference. So one thing we heard as we were talking to uh, uh, community college faculty members as we were planning this is that one real sticking point, and this is true for us here at the University of Colorado as well, um, is student motivation. Um, and trying to think about how to get students engaged and how to really build on motivation um, to help learning. Because after all, motivation is really um, one of the most important pieces of, uh, of any education. It, edu learning takes hard work, and so if you're not really motivated to engage in that, um, you're not going to put in the effort required to learn. So what we've tried to do with this uh, event is to have this sort of red thread of motivation. We're not going to have talks on motivation, but we've asked each of the presenters to at least say a few words about how motivation plays in um, to the particular educational technique that they'll be talking about. And I, um, we also, uh, I wanted to just sort of give a little bit of framework first. That, like there are three big areas of motivation um, that uh, really play in. One is personal relevance and interest. So having learning activities that the student feels are of interest to them, are personally relevant, are authentic, are things that they really want to engage in. And that's going to really vary um, by the student population. Another is that students have a sense of choice and control, a sense of autonomy, a sense of ownership. Um, and this could be that they choose what kind of tasks to engage, uh, engage in, but it could also be that they have a sense that within that particular activity um, that they're engaged in, that they are choosing what paths to follow um, and what choices to make. And that, that can have a real impact on student motivation. And then lastly, having a sense that one can master the material a sense that you have the ability to learn this and it's not outside of your grasp. And there are a lot of things that you can do as an instructor to help um, <coughs> implicate that kind of um, idea. So we, uh, because this is a, a, a theme, there is a handout in your folders that sort of summarizes in two pages all the research on motivating student learning. <laughs> um, so it's just sort of a handy reference um, that I hope will be, will be useful to you. So uh, I just wanted to say, you know, those few words of framing around motivation, and we'll come back to, to that at the very end of the conference. Um, but now I want to turn it over to Gabrielle for a, a few logistical notes, and then we're going to get started. Yeah. Welcome, everybody. It's so exciting to see you in person after looking at your names on spreadsheets for the last several weeks. So I'm glad you made it. Um, just a quick overview of the day, and then we'll jump into our first round of workshops. Um, 
There's three times periods where we have workshops, and at those time slots, there's either two or three workshops happening at the same time. On the back of your badge is your recommended um, schedule for workshops, so it should have three letters, and that's your suggestion of where you should go at 9.15, where you should go at 11, and where you should go at 2. Um, we will be back in here for lunch at 12.30, and we have a recommended uh, table for you to sit at, which will be 1 through 7, so we've tried to um, organize some lunch groups around discipline so that you would be mixed up with people from other institutions, but who share some interests and teaching challenges with you, so that you have a suggested, recommended lunch table. And then um, for the last three um, activities of the day, we'll be in a different room. So for the morning, we'll either be in here, the Flatirons room, or we'll be in room S350, which is down the hall and to the right. And then after 345, we'll be in the Abrams lounge, which is also down the hall and to the right. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention is that some of the workshop sessions will be filmed. And we have a sign on the door indicating it will be filmed. Um, if that's something you don't want to participate in, um, you could go to the alternate time of that workshop session, or you could try to sit towards the back of the room. So it's not going to be a live moving camera. It will be fixed on a tripod. Um, but you get royalties. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> so we just wanted to make sure you were aware of that, and we can work around it if you're not comfortable. And those are films to be put on our on our website for people who can't make it. Um, I think that's it. So with with that, I think we'll go forward and uh, start our first round of workshops.